Here's a bird's eye view of Burning Man, the annual performing arts extravaganza in the California desert, as seen from the Skylight Pavilion at the Kennedy Center. This was part of a five-part installation series bringing to life different performing arts experiences in the Skylight Pavilion, which began like this. The transformation of that space to a cathedral or the inside of a synthesizer or Burning Man is curating. During the past 15 years, creating concerts for orchestras as a composer and club shows as a DJ, I've thought a lot about how we experience music, about how we can get information to the audience in new ways, and how we can experiment with the frame around the music we hear. I decided to put together this mini, mini series about curating, and it has three parts. Programming, production, and platform. Programming is the heart of curating. It's the music you choose and the order you present it. And I advocate for a diverse approach to musical style and musical forces. Production is in some ways the hardest part. Lighting, the musicians, stagecraft, the way you put them around the space, ambient information, the way you share information about the program, trying to explode the program book from a 19th century format into something more immersive, and platform. The last part of curating is the entire experience of a concert, from the moment you walk in to the moment you leave. If you do that with fresh eyes, you see that there are quite a few places where we could add elements to a concert that could bring a broader audience. So programming, production, and platform. And today we'll start with programming. There are some principles about programming that maintain from a chamber music concert all the way to something as immersive as the skylight spaces. And one of them is diversity in aesthetic. The skylight spaces went all the way from techno from Detroit and Berlin to Renaissance choral music to the inside of a synthesizer to the deserts of California to hear Burning Man music and finally ended up in Appalachia. I think that approach is also important even if you're doing something more traditional. Here's a concert that has everything from Dana Romain's hip hop etudes to the John Adams Chamber Symphony. Changes in instrumental forces from the solo to the large scale are really useful if it's possible when you're programming a concert. That can give you a lot of really good moments of contrast that every concert always benefits from. Back to a less traditional approach, Lounge Regime, 100 Years of Ambient Music, started in the Salons of Paris, hearing the furniture music of Eric Satie, and went all the way through California Minimalism and ended up uh, with today's ambient electronica. This was envisioned as a kind of walk-through diorama of a kind of music that doesn't really lend itself well to live performance. It's more about the space that it inhabits. But still, you can see the approach of diversity and forces in musical aesthetic, and not least, musical background of the composer. It's important to draw from a lot of different kinds of backgrounds, such as Victor Gama from Angola, Africa, an instrument builder, or the synthesizer duo from Stranger Things, Michael Stein and Kyle Dixon. Now, any concert program has the opportunity to get weird. This is something that I admire about Michael Tilson Thomas's programming from the San Francisco Symphony to the New World Symphony. He's always surprising his listeners in adventurous ways and also in accessible ways. I noticed this when he led the YouTube Symphony 10 years ago. This could have been being a fairly overfunded and overproduced concert, basically like a pop show. But Michael programmed everything from Gabrielli to John Cage to a new piece by me to Lou Harrison. He kept it really interesting. Michael's protégés, uh, Teddy Abrams and Edwin Outwater, are also masters of programming, and I encourage you to check out what they've been doing with their orchestras. The goal is to bring the deep experience of classical music to a wide audience, to an audience that might not know every composer that's contributed to the repertoire over the past hundreds of years. And in order to have that programming freedom, we need to look to production. The more that we can make the experience about the concert experience and not have to live or die on the fact that a composer 
like Bartok, might not be familiar to a layperson, then the more programming freedom we'll have. So we'll next look at production.